Thanks so much for joining um, and thank you so much Adam and Joanna for, for doing the session for us today. Um, I'll be rejoining you for the Q&A session once you're finished with your presentation, um, but I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Okay, thank you Isa for the introduction. Uh, welcome everyone, it's, it's great to be here at Geovation, even if it's uh, virtual this time. Uh, so my name is Joanna Simões, I am a developer relations at OGC. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Adam Mew, from Ordnance, uh, Ordnance Survey, Product Manager, Manager at Ordnance Survey. And we're here today to talk a little bit about uh, OGC standards and uh, hopefully to give you some ideas why they are uh, relevant or the, why they could be relevant for uh, the work you are developing. So uh, the agenda that we prepare uh, is, is this one. So we start with some uh, general introduction, going over some, some concepts uh, about geospatial data, standards, why using standards. And then we are going to go a bit deeper into some OGC standards that are uh, being developed right now at OGC. Uh, and we'll learn about uh, how you can uh, leverage those uh, through the OS Data Hub. Uh, and at the end, uh, hopefully, if I can get you excited about the standards and wanting to to get involved and participate, I'll give you some I'll give you some pointers on how you can do that and how we can continue the conversation uh, after this webinar. So the use case for uh, this webinar is basically uh, could be someone who has a bunch of geospatial data and wants to make it available for, for others or, or even for themselves in order to do something with this data. So how can we share geospatial data in a way which is efficient? And we can also see the other way around. How can we ac access uh, geospatial data from multiple sources uh, in a way that is efficient? So this will be uh, the focus of, of this webinar today. And let's start to talk a little bit about what geospatial data is. I mean, uh, you obviously, you are a geovation. This is something that uh, you got it across uh, at one point or the other. Uh, and geospatial data is, uh, is ubiquitous in, uh, in today's life. I mean, you can get it from Internet of Things. You can get it from various platforms like Uber, uh, Airbnb, you have OpenStreetMap, so it's it's really something that has become part of our everyday life somehow. But what what really is geospatial data? So basically, any piece of information which has a location tag attached to it can be considered geospatial data. And when I say a location tag, it could be anything. It could be a postcode, an address. Uh, the name of a country, and so on. But ultimately, uh, names can be ambiguous. So for instance, if I say London, uh, it could be uh, interpreted as London in Ontario or London in the UK, which, you know, as, as you know, they're very, very far away from each other. So obviously, this would be, uh, this would be mean very different things. So ultimately, the only way that we have to locate something unambiguously in the surface of the Earth is to use a pair of geographic coordinates, so latitude and longitude. So this is the way that we can use to really be accurate uh, when we want to, to locate something. So how can we share geospatial data? This was the, the question that I had in the first slide, but let's go back to it. So one for, could think that uh, the first thing that could come to mind could be to use a file. So we could use a file, a format that allows us to store these uh, geographical coordinates so that supports storing geometry and information about the coordinate reference system. Uh, and, there, and there are many formats that, uh, that can do that. Uh, the main advantage is that it's simple to use but then you could think uh, probably of many uh, drawbacks. First thing is if I want to give, let's say, 
uh, a file to Adam with some geospatial information, uh, I will have to email him the, the file or give him a hard drive or even worse, the CD. <laughs> uh, and then later on, so, so there will be two copies of my information lying around. So if I change something and later on I want to give Adam the, the latest version, I will need to email him again. <laughs> So th this is not very convenient, and worst of all, can lead to problems with uh, uh, consistency because at a, at a given point you may not, may have a different um, a different set of information than the one that I have. And if I want to share it with all of you, there will be like uh, 21 copies of the file lying around. So obviously, uh, anyone who works with data can think, okay, let's use a database because database is like the ultimate way to to share information uh, in a way that is uh, that is secure and it it really uh, it really safeguards all these things that we are talking about like uh, integrity make sure there is only one copy of the data that it, this is like uh, at, at a given moment it's secure so it, it comes with all um, with all the ability to to let many people access it at the same time and so on so it's it's a really sound uh, strategy to, to share information. But uh, databases, unfortunately, this all comes with complexity. So uh, anyone who access the database uh, knows that uh, we need some uh, some housekeeping to in order to connect to the database. So uh, basically, we need to create a, a connection string where we need to define Okay, what, what is the host? Where, where is the database located? Which port are we using? What's the name? And then because of security, um, because of, of the security, we need to pass as well a username, a password, and so on. So actually we need, before connecting to, to the database, we need to do all these things. And then uh, we also need to uh, query the database, use these, um, this query language, which could be more or less complex, depending on which information we we want to extract. Uh, so, for it, it's true that uh, it allows you, uh, I mean, a lot of flexibility. You can do whatever you want with the data. But if you have a very simple use case all the time, like you just want to access um, a certain layer, a certain data set. Uh, and that's it. You you also need to do this. You need to always do this boilerplate. So what what's the alternative to do this? Uh, web APIs. I mean, everyone is using web APIs right now. They are um, they are very popular and with a reason because they are very simple. They are flexible, and they are very scalable. And REST APIs uh, since the beginnings of 2010 and so on have been exploding. So it's it's becoming something that is very, very much um, common in the web these days. So an example of how you could do this to access some geospatial data is you could have, for instance, data stored in a, a MongoDB database or another database. Then you could use this PyGeo API, which is a web API. Uh, that retrieves the data or gives access to the data in the database and lets you use it uh, and lets clients consume it. And PyGeo API is exposing the data or publishing the data using a standard. And this is what I want to talk about in the in the rest of our uh, presentation. So why why should we use a standard rather than just exposing the data with an ad hoc convention using a web API. Why, why should we do that? Okay, I, I like to give the example of uh, coffee pods here. So if I if I have a, an espresso machine at home and I go to the supermarket, um, sorry, if I have a capsule machine and I go to the supermarket, I am faced with a variety of options. So I have a, a different uh, different brands like you can see here, like Delta, Nescafe, uh, Nespresso. Even within Nespresso, there are different cups uh, depending on where, whether I'm using um, a commercial machine, an industrial machine, or I'm, I'm using uh, a, a regular machine. 
so it, it's really uh, it's really not uh, not easy sometimes to find the pods for the machine that I have at home, right? And not many people know, but there is a standard for coffee pots. So if you use these uh, traditional espresso machines, the ones that you see there, uh, there is uh, e Ely has, has developed this uh, easy serving espresso pod, which is basically just a just a bag with coffee with it, with this particular shape, and then you can use it in all these machines. And you can use it regardless the machine being um, a Krups machine or being uh, a DeLonghi machine, it works everywhere. And this is great for the, the people who produce uh, espresso machines because they can, uh, they, they can consume the coffee pots from different brands. And it's great for the, the producers of, of the coffee pots because they can use them in different machines, right? Uh, but I think most of all, it's great for the users because the users don't have this problem anymore that I have when I go to the supermarket and I cannot find the right coffee pot. So basically, uh, this is uh, we can bring this now to the to the geospatial world. In the case of geospatial world, we don't want to share coffee, uh, but we want to share geospatial information. And our main uh, objective is to share it in an efficient way so that uh, other people can use it, but also machines can use it. So computer programs can consume easily our information. And, and we want to do this because we want the data to be reusable. If we don't do it, then the data will remain in silos. So, so this is the reason why we would like to use um, standards. For, I mean, for geospatial information as for other information, but we, today we're going to talk about uh, in the geospatial context. And in the geospatial context, the organization that deals with the, with the standards is OGC. So I, I'm going to talk about this in a second, but first I want to give you a, an example for, from the geospatial world. So web maps, I think most, most people have already used web maps. I mean, we use them every day uh, with Google Maps, for instance. Uh, the way that uh, web maps wor work is, is, is mostly uh, every time is, is always the same. So regardless you are using uh, um, Mapbox or OpenStreetMap or Google Maps, the model is always the same. So you have a pyramid of tiles and these tiles are organized by uh, zoom levels from the highest zoom level to the lowest zoom level. And then within each zoom level, you have, uh, they are organized by coordinates. So they are organ organized by X and Y, and these coordinates map to the latitude and longitude. So every time a client makes a request to the server and asks for a tile, he says, hey, uh, I want this layer, I mean the satellite uh, image of the herd, for instance, I, I want the zoom level and I want these coordinates. And then uh, the, the server converts this and knows where to go in the pyramid and retrieve the tile. So it's, it's always the same. We're always uh, more or less following this, this path. But then when you look at uh, particular implementations, these, these are the URLs that Google Maps uses for requesting tiles, Mapbox, and OpenStreetMap. And if you look at the URL, the way they are, they are asking for this information is different. So the, the order, the way they encode the coordinates, and so on. So they're, they're, the three of them are different. What does this mean? This means that if I have a client that understands Google Maps, and then tomorrow I want to connect to the Mapbox, I cannot reuse it. I need to rewrite the, the client. And the same for, for the others. So basically, as a user, uh, if I have something that works for one of these servers, it does not mean that it will, will work for the others. And the same for the, the servers. I mean, if I have uh, Google Maps, uh, it won't work with any client. It just works with the clients that understand Google Maps. And, and I know that we are used to this, but uh, what I wanted to tell you is it's, it's 
possible to have something different. Okay, so this is the reality that we have uh, until now, but we can have something different. And you could be part of this as uh, startups and, and innovators, you could build something different. So as I told you, the Open Geospatial Consortium is the organization that uh, manages these, uh, these geospatial standards. So it's an international voluntary consensus organization, which is very important because standards need to be um, developed. If we want them to be uh, really standards, they need to be developed by an independent body. And in this case, there are more than 500 members. Members comes from, come from all sectors. They came from industry. You can have large companies like the ones that you see below. We can have like startups, uh, SMEs, organizations, and so on. So we, we they come, everyone that works with geospatial data could be a, a, an OGC member. And the standards are developed by a, a process, a, for, a formal processes uh, that ensures that the, the final result, result is optimal so that we can reach the maximum degree of interoperability between applications and that we address all the use cases that uh, we, we need to address. So Ordnance Survey is a, is a strategic OGC member, which means it's a, a member with a, with a special stance in, in, in OGC that can um, participate in the, in the planning committee and so on. But there are many other members. I, I don't know if Adam wants to say a few words about the OGC as a, the Ordnance Survey as a member. I think the only thing I would say is just like you said before, you know, we're able to get involved in the early stages of that discussion, involved in the committees, and have a really hands-on role in terms of developing those standards. And and you mentioned about interoperability, and that's obviously a key thing as well. Um, so from an OS side of things, you know, it's really key that we remain close to the OGC and that we become part of that conversation and remain part of that conversation. Okay, thank you, thank you, Adam. So. Uh, Orna survey, along with uh, all the other members, the, the 500 members uh, from OGC, they participate in this process where we create the standards. And what, what is a standard? It's really a document that uh, was established by, by consensus, by following all this process, and that provides basically some guidelines. It, pro it, pro it provides some criteria that needs to be ful fulfilled. and this criteria is designed so that we can maximize the degree of interoperability. What's inside the, the standard? So we have uh, this criteria, we call it requirements. So we have basically, we have these requirements and it's very important in OGC standards that the requirements are testable uh, because this is the way that we, we have to say, uh, in order to say that a given implementation is conformant or not, if the implementation is compliant to the standard. So we need to be able to test it. And this is why we designed these uh, conformance tests. So there, there should be tests for requirements and we group them in conformance classes. And, and these conformance classes are like groups of tests that allows us to say, okay, this implementation is fulfilling this criteria or not. So this is an example from a standard that you can see how a requirement looks like. And then we have the, the text, the test. It's an abstract test. So it's not, it's agnostic of any um, programming language. Uh, and in theory, you should be able to implement it using any programming language that you, that you will, will like. So this is, uh, this is the ideal world. So this is the world where uh, we would be using standards. So I'm I'm sitting in my computer and I want to access data from a given server. And it doesn't matter what 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 is the the software that this uh, server is using. Um, it could be it could be LD proxy. It could be PyGeo API. Uh, I, I should not care about that because the sender is publishing the data using a standard, in this case, OGC API features. And then I can also use 
uh, any tool I like. I can use a Jupyter notebook, I can use a QGIS, a web browser, uh, and so on. So for, for the user, this should be really, really painless. Uh, I think this is what, mostly this is what we want to achieve uh, with the standards. Uh, the OGC APIs are a family of standards that is being developed in the late uh, 2017, in, from, from 2017 until now in OGC. And this, this, this is a family of standards. Uh, I mean, there are many different OGC APIs, but in common, uh, they have the, these characteristics that I, I show here. So basically, they are leveraging the, the practices of the modern web. So they are using REST, they are using uh, HTTP status code, um, content negotiation, and so on. So all, all the practices that you already see and you're probably using, uh, they are uh, in the OGC API standards. They are also leveraging the schema.org so that the search engines are able to find geospatial data. This is very important these days because people are searching for data uh, in Google and in the search engines. Uh, and they, they are self-documented. So they are using the open API specification in order to uh, publish all the, um, all the different calls. So basically, if you want to learn about this standard, uh, in the past, you would have to read like through a 500 uh, page document and, and you're still very welcome to do it. But if you want, you can just open the interactive documentation from the open API and you can see what the requests look like and you can try them, you can look at the answers and, and you can do that in, in a interactive way and start developing something just by doing that. So these standards are, are very flexible. Uh, first of all, they are uh, developed in, in, in parts. So you, you have one part that is uh, focus in a certain aspect of the standard and another part. And if you want, you can just use parts of the standard. So they are like building blocks. They are like pieces of Lego and you can combine them uh, and you can uh, bring them to your APIs. They're also very flexible regarding the encodings. So there are no mandatory encodings, uh, but we recommend encodings like popular encodings like JSON or GeoJSON or HTML, just because this is what you see in the web uh, anyway. Uh, so the, the main goal of uh, following all these uh, practices is to improve the developer experience so that uh, it's easy for anyone, even if you're not uh, an OGC expert or even a GIS expert, it's easy to, uh, to look at the standards, learn them and, and, and then start uh, developing them, start implementing them. So this is the family of uh, OGC API standards. And each standard is focused on a particular aspect of geospatial information. So for instance, uh, uh, moving features, OGC API moving features is focused on uh, feature data that is moving. Like you can think of, uh, for instance, uh, pedestrians walking. Uh, OGC API, uh, uh, IDR or env environmental data retrieval is focused on uh, data sets, uh, environmental data sets with that, which have particular aspects. They are continuous on, on date and time and you want to sample them. Um, OGC API routes is fo focused on routing data. So you can see that each, each type of standard is focused on a particular aspect of geospatial information, although the, the, some are more specific than others. And they are also in different stages of development. So these standards are, are uh, I, I could say cutting edge, so they are re really relatively recent and modern. And some of them are more advanced. They are being, uh, some parts of the standard have been already approved and others are still in the early stages. But I think this should not be discouraging. I think quite the opposite. If you like some of the standards, even if it's the standard is in development, this means that you can 
jump in and you can contribute to the development of the standard and you can make it better and you can make sure that it's uh, covering your use cases. So these are some OGC APIs that uh, provide uh, an interface for different types of data. So uh, coverages, for instance, it provides access to coverage data like earth observation images. Then you have tiles that provides access to tiles of geospatial information. These tiles could be uh, vector tiles, could be map tiles, but it could, they could also be uh, coverages. And then you have routes, and routes provi provides access to routes, routing data, basically, routing in, in a way that it's uh, independent of the, the, the data set and also the, of the algorithm. And then you have OGC API features, which provides access to feature data. So OGC API features is a, a standard that has already two parts approved. So in this context, it could be considered a mature standard. And uh, it's a very interesting standard because it's aligned with other uh, specifications. So it's aligned with um, ISO uh, specification and also with the stack API. What, what does this mean? It, it means that if your uh, application is conformant with uh, OGC API features, in this case, part one, it means it will be compatible with the stack API and also with ISO 19168-1-2020. So it's completely uh, uh, compatible with, with the three of them. Uh, so the, the, the first part of uh, OGC API features, uh, the first model or building block, uh, defines discovery and query operations. So it means that you can basically uh, access uh, feature data uh, using this API. So what is feature data? I like to talk about that because uh, feature has uh, other meanings outside the, the context of geography. So features, for instance, in the, in the context of software engineer mean uh, a, new, uh, a new, new functionality that is going to be implemented. But for geographers, Features mean something of interest in the surface of the earth. And, and this something could be anything. So it could be uh, the location of a, an earthquake. It could be a route. It could even be something fictional like uh, the regions in, in Game of Thrones. So anything that you can uh, give it a, a location to, uh, it could be considered a, a feature. So this is how uh, the requests in uh, OGC API features would look like. So first of all, you can retrieve what are the collections available in a given server. So collections, you can think of them as uh, data sets or, or layers if you come from a GIS background. So it's uh, a set of data of the same kind. Uh, so you, you retrieve the, the list of collections and you navigate for a given collection. So you, you, you retrieve some metadata, some information about this collection. And finally, you get the data. So you can get the, the items of, of the collection or the features if you want. And, and then if you, you can also uh, retrieve a particular uh, item in this collection or a, a particular feature. So you navigate from, from the list to the collection with the items and then to the feature. So this will this is what OGC API features parts one gives us a way, uh, a standard way to retrieve this information. There are already some implementations of OGC API features out there. So currently uh, uh, in the features website, we have listed 10 server side implementations. So 10 servers that publish data uh, using OGC API features. Uh, a part of these, a subset of these is uh, our open source, free and open source uh, software that anyone could uh, download and start using. And then we have eight client side implementations uh, using various uh, languages, uh, JavaScript, uh, uh, Java, and so on. 
and uh, this list is growing. So uh, I, you can see the logs of some of, of these implement, implementations. This is uh, a very well-known software. Uh, maybe some of the software is software that you are already using. Uh, so this software is uh, supporting currently OGC API features. So if you would like to know more about these standards, um, I invite you to, to, to visit this uh, website and here you can find uh, more details about what each one of the parts of the standard uh, does. And also you can see examples of servers that are already publishing data uh, using OGC API features. And you can also find the list, the complete list of current implementations if you are interested and with the links to, to downloading and, and some resources to also learn more about, about the standards. So I invite you to, to go to this page. This could be uh, a good place to start uh, if you want to give the, the first steps uh, using this standard. So uh, I, I give the word to, to Adam to tell us a little bit more about uh, how the standards within the, the OS Data Hub. No worries. Um, yeah, so just want to take a few minutes just to go through what we're up to on the OS Data Hub and where OGC standards fit, in, fit into this. Um, so for those of you not familiar with OS Data Hub, um, it was launched back in 2020 by way of um, delivering the public sector geospatial agreement, working with the geospatial commission, um, but also as well to make our state a lot more open and accessible to uh, a range of developers, whether they come from private sector or, or startups or essentially hobbyists. Um, and there's a couple of standards that, uh, that are currently being used on the data hub. So that is the um, WMTS and the WFS standards, so slightly older standards. Um, and what I wanted to do is just, just obviously you know, Joanna's done a really good job at contextualizing, you know, what is geospatial data, what are the standards and why they're so important is just to provide a, few, a couple of use cases around how uh, those standards are being used via the OS Data Hub. Um, and then also what we're doing on top of that, a little bit further down the line around um, implementing newer standards. Um, Joanna, are you able just to switch on to the, to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Um, so the, the OS Data Hub is essentially the access method or the access capability for OS products. So there's two different ways of access. One is via downloads and the other is via APIs. Um, like I said, we're currently using the WMTS and WFS standards. Um, and there's a couple of really interesting use cases as around how those standards are, are being used. Um, the WMTS is the easiest way to get OS data onto a base map. Um, and the National Library of Scotland does that really well. They, they've got an aspect to their website that they show historical maps on. Um, and there's a kind of slider function. So if you go onto that, you can see what the maps look like within a certain year um, in history and then to how they look, how they look now. Um, so it's a really, really interesting use case and they do that really well. Um, and they use um, the OS Maps API as their base map. And, and also what that enables them to do is have the most up-to-date um, kind of base maps um, via the API. So really, really interesting use case. Um, we've also got Property XYZ. So Property XYZ actually used to be a Juvation member um, and work really closely with OS. Um, and they use the WFS service. Um, the w, the, sorry, they use the WFS um, standards. So um, they use the OS maps as a base map to get a contextual layer. And then using the OS Features API um, enables customers to interact with the features. Um, and they can also get some detailed attribution on that. Um, there's another use case um, with a company called Pair Technology. Um, and they actually use a base map. And what they do is on their on their map shop is allow um, allow customers or allow users to come on and to create a poly and, and to create polygons on top of the base map. Um, so some really, really interesting use cases. Um, obviously, if you want to know some more, then then feel free to to reach out or check out any sort of the documentation. Um, there's lots of tutorials and and examples of how um, the, the how how users and um, organisations are using OS data. Um, in terms of new capabilities, so we've got um, some new capabilities being released onto the Date Hub next month. That's based on the OGC feature standards. So um, if if you were to to listen back on this, if you jump back in a few slides, Joanna goes into detail around those 
around those standards. Uh, and the use case for that essentially is, is not only to make, is the whole thing around interoperability. We, you know, we want to make um, the OS data accessible to as many um, different kind of types, different um, kind of use cases and a much wider adoption of developers across the board. Um, and in, in addition to that, um, we use using adding kind of improved functionality on there, such as temporal, temporal filtering um, and continuing to um, adopt the latest standards from OGC. So um, there's some kind of conversations going around about using the, the um, OGC tiles API. Um, so as mentioned before, it's really, really key that we remain close to the OGC, obviously being a strategic member of the OGC, we, we kind of involved in a lot of the discussions, but also from a, from a kind of, from the data standpoint as a digital product that we're making sure that those standards are, are accessible through, through APIs. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll hand it back over to, to Joanna. Um, thank you. Thank you, Adam. So uh, I think the, the next step is, um, one could think how, how could we get involved with, uh, with OGC and, and participate in this, um, in the crafting of all these standards or at least learn more about it. Uh, so I think the, the way, the, the most uh, immediate way or the most obvious way would be to join an OGC working group. So there are two types of working groups in OGC. One is the standard working groups, and these are the groups that actually develop the standards and maintain the standards because the standards are um, constantly revised, so improved. Uh, and, and an example will be to join the Features API Standard Working Group, which is the one that develops the OGC API feature standards that I, I, I told you about. But there are others. So basically, a, each OGC standard has uh, one um, standard working group. And there, there is another type of uh, working groups, which is called the domain working groups. And this domain working groups are not focused on one particular standard, but they focus on areas of interest or domains. And within these domains, uh, there could be many different standards that are relevant. So they are more focused on addressing the interoperability in a certain domain and how we can do that uh, through standards. And I, I've put below uh, examples of uh, domain working groups uh, that could be interesting for you, like uh, the mobile location services domain working group, the simulation and gaming domain working group, or the smart cities uh, domain working group. There, there could be others like uh, the 3D uh, domain working group, which is focused on 3D data. And recently we started the Metaverse Domain Working Group, uh, which, um, which Ordnance Survey is part of. So maybe Adam could say a few words about that as well. Yeah, sure. So um, yes, I've actually been involved in a few discussions around, uh, around what OS's stance is around the Metaverse. I think initially it's gonna be more of a, uh, it, it's gonna be through working with the OGC and on that domain working group on, on the standards. Um, I think it's going to be more passive in terms of a lot of it's going to be research based and, and kind of listen and learn. Um, there's kind of other focuses going on. The reason that I just mentioned about the, the metaverse, the main working group is, you know, if there's any, uh, there's anybody that's interested in getting involved, um, obviously those that are part of Geovation have got a direct link into, into OS. Uh, and obviously now an indirect link into OGC. So key thing there really is if you do want to get involved, then then you know you feel free to reach out at any time and be part of those conversations and be part of the um, of that that whole working group. Okay, so uh, in order to join the working groups or most of the working groups, you need to be a, an OGC member. Uh, you can check in the link how how you can become a member if you wish to so. And there are many advantages. But there are other things that you can do uh, that do not, do not require a membership in OGC. And one of those is to uh, check the GitHub repositories of the different standards. So currently the, the standards, the OGC API standards are developed in, in GitHub, so publicly, and anyone is welcome to join the discussions and even to 
file issues uh, and contribute uh, through a pull request. So basically, most of the standard development is done there and anyone is free to participate. This is most of the, the standards, so 99%. So, so the last 1%, which requires the polishing of the standard, the voting and so on, this is done through the R RFC process, so within uh, the standard working groups. But this part, uh, you are very welcome to, to participate uh, even today if, if you are interested. So the, the way the standards are developed, it's uh it's it's an agile way so basically um we like to put the the standards out there for receiving feedback from the community and this is done through the ogc code sprints so these are three-day uh collaborative events up to now they've been uh, vir virtual or in the, the the last two years they've been uh, virtual but now we're resuming the the hybrid format so the the code sprint you could attend in person, but you could also attend virtually. And each code sprint is focused on normally on a group of standards which are related. So it could be, for instance, uh, standards related to um, to tiles or to vector data or to um, to grid data and so on. So that there's normally a common denominator. Anyone is free to attend the, these code sprints. And uh, during the code sprints, we normally what we have uh, a lot of discussions. So there are uh, schedules, uh, slots for discussions where, where everyone comes and, and meets. And between that time, we have coding. So people are normally either wor working on implementations of the standards, updating their implementations of the standards, uh, or uh, in the standards themselves. So this is a, a great opportunity in one hand for for the people who are implementers, for the developers to uh, advance their implementations of the standards and, and but on the other hand to also advance the standards with, with the feedback that we have from the implementers because we want to make sure that these standards are addressing uh, the use cases uh, that are out there. They are addressing the, 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 the implementations. Uh, recently, we have introduced also a mentor stream, and this is designed for people that are not familiar with the standards, but they want to learn. And in the mentor streams, you can access um, tutorials, a stream of tutorials about uh, different um, different implementations or even about the standard itself. Uh, and you can also access mentors. So if you are interested in a, in a given project, you can uh, you can ask a mentor to, to support you during the code sprint. So I would say, uh, even if you are not uh, very involved with the standards until now, this could be a good place to start. So you can check in this, uh, in this uh, URL, you can check the complete list uh, of events, the past events and sometimes the, the future events normally we organize like uh, four or five uh, code sprints a, a year. And the next code sprint uh, will be soon, uh, in uh, 14 to 16 of September, and it will take place in Geovation, London. So if you want to be to attend the sprint in person, uh, it, this is a good opportunity. Uh, so you, this code sprint will be focused on metadata, so basically standards that are related to uh, metadata and catalogs of geospatial information uh, but we will also have uh, cover fgjson which is an encoding uh, for 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 geospatial data that is being uh, developed recently in ogc and this is meant to be uh, like a superset of geojson uh, and it also uh, we will also cover stack because stack api because this is also a catalog of geospatial information so you are very welcome to, to register. Registrations are open already in the URL that you can see below and, and they are free. And then we'll have another code sprint in December. Um, it will also be hybrid. So the, the Geovation code sprint is, is hybrid as well if you want to attend um, virtually. 
Uh, the one in December, the location is yet to be announced. It will be most likely in Europe. And this one will be focused on web mapping. So basically it will cover uh, OGC API tiles, uh, OGC API maps and OGC API styles. So all uh, standards that are uh, designed to support the use cases of, uh, of web mapping. Uh, this, all the code sprints take place in uh, the OGC events Discord channel. Uh, you are very welcome to join this channel as well uh, and keep updated with the uh, future events and also participate in discussions that take place there even uh, during the code sprints. Uh, you, you can join the, the channel when, whenever you like. Uh, Bear in mind that if you want to access the the, the specific channels that are uh, related to the code sprint, you need to re register to the code sprint first and then go through the check-in process. So I I encourage you to to register the, to the code sprint if you want to access every single channel within the OGC uh, events uh, server. So the the idea that I the the main ideas that I wanted to leave uh, here today is that uh, APIs are are very popular and they are popular for a reason because they they have they are very um, easy to develop they uh, they have some elements of interoperability in the sense that everyone understands uh, uh, the status codes the methods and so on uh, but if we use APIs uh, for geospatial data and each one of us uses their own ad hoc way of representing data and sharing data, then uh, it will be difficult uh, for these APIs to communicate with each other. And so this is where the OGC API standards can have uh, uh, a key role. Uh, we, OGC welcomes developers to uh, use the standards, but also to contribute to the standards, to improve them, to give them your, your feedback, because the idea ultimately is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to uh, all together make it better. We want to perfect it. So I want to leave you with this uh, with this call. Uh, join, join, participate, uh, and contribute because uh, we want to make a better feature where geospatial data is not in silos but is shared by by everyone. So thank you very much for for your time, uh, and I would like to we would like to leave you with the uh, with our contacts. I think I think we have time for for some questions, but even if you want to reach out later, uh, either to, to me or Adam, uh, you you are very welcome. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anna and Joanna. <laughs> um, gosh, yeah, there was a lot of information there. I hope no one's been, <laughs> everyone's not feeling too overwhelmed. We appreciate there's a lot of detail there. Um, thanks so much for providing your details directly as well, of course. Um, so to, for people to reach out, it's really, really nice. Um, otherwise, always uh, you can always email events at geovation.uk um, as well if you have any further questions. Um, like I mentioned, you'll get the recording and the slides as well uh, in a follow-up email as well so you have all the details there to recap to re reiterate re you know put them in here <laughs> um uh but yeah if you've got any questions please do fire them into the question section in your control panel uh and we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can um uh, you obviously mentioned you know becoming an ogc member um the, i guess two two part question there um uh, what are the are there any costs involved to be an ogc member and also um i guess could you elaborate a little bit more on um you know uh, what benefits there might be for some of our startups in in becoming an ogc member as a whole sure uh, i mean th there are some costs associated uh the costs depend on basically on the size of the organization the size of the revenue and so um in the in the link that i i left there uh there are there are the different uh levels of membership um which you could uh, access to and the the benefits uh, i think the, the there are some 
very uh, immediate benefits of being a mem member like the networking so we will be uh, tapping into a network of uh, different organizations like uh, also uh, companies but also government uh, organizations like uh, ordnance survey nasa and so on uh, and there will be uh, visibility so the the company would have uh, the possibility of um, of bringing their brand uh, or of, of of using the ogc channels to to make make themselves uh, more more visible uh, there will be also access to r d so ogc organizes uh, uh, test beds and pilots in order to test the technology and uh, the companies will be will have the possibility to to join these uh, test beds which are funded and they could uh, contribute with their uh, technology to to improve the, the the standard but i i think the the biggest benefit will be to to make an impact in the location industry and to lower the barriers to integration and operations by by offering this sort of open and, and scalable solutions i hope this answers the question yes yeah and of course uh, feel free to fire any follow-up questions into the uh, question section i don't know why i feel i feel like i'm fired up because i keep saying fire <laughs> sorry um thank you so much for that um uh, uh well, sorry I, i've lost my window there here we go um so uh, another question would be how can i make sure that one application is conformant to the standard Interesting. yeah that's that's a very good question so um i i said before that uh, we we have these requirements so we want to make sure they're testable but how can how can we test them are there tests out there yes uh, ogc is a compliance program and in this compliance program tests are provide, provided uh, for any uh, OGC standard. So if you have one implementation uh, and you want, to, uh, you want to test it, you can use either the OGC test instance or you could download the tests and do it yourself. Uh, and this works also uh, the other way around. If you want to check if one in particular implementation, one software is compliant to the standard, uh, you could also access a list of uh, uh, implementations that are listed as compliant. So this means that uh, they are certified by OGC. They, they submitted um, the results of their tests, they, 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 or, or they submitted the test, they were submitted to the tests. And then finally, they receive a compliance badge, which says that they are certified by OGC, and it means that they are interoperable. In a, in a given, um, so, so uh, we, we normally uh, recommend people to use uh, uh, implementations that are uh, compliant, that went through this process so that we can make sure that they are really, really um, inter uh, implementing the standard in the way that uh, makes it optimal. Fabulous. Okay, um, thanks so much. Um, uh, if you have any questions, do again, uh, please put them into the questions section. Um, this is this is all the questions for now. I appreciate that there's a lot of, you know, sort of wheels spinning yep. to to stay to stay in with the, the theme of the day, <laughs> or with your sort of final thought there. Yes. Um, uh, so we appreciate that you might have questions further down the line. Of course, you've got um, Adam and Joanna's details right there in front of you. Obviously, as I said, you'll also be getting those. In, a, in your follow-up emails um so if you do want to reach out to them especially also if you want to talk about the ogc membership and so what costs would be involved specifically in your case then i'm sure joanna will give you all the details uh, that you might need um and as i said the recording will also be coming your way uh, we always appreciate of course understanding how well we've done in the session or how useful you found it but also really, really what else you are interested in hearing about. Um, I always run sessions that are relevant to our community that are, you know, the most lucrative that help you, uh, you know, release your blockages. And um, I can't really do that unless I know what those are. So um, I have shared uh, the feedback link in the chat there, but I will also include that in your follow-up email. So if you do have three to four minutes uh, to give us your feedback on the session, but also on the events program as a whole and what you're hoping to see in the future, 
that will be hugely appreciated because it's really important to me that I run sessions that are most relevant and most helpful to you and our community. Um, also, if you're not a GeoNation member, I have again shared the link in how to become one. Uh, um, it's free of charge for individuals, so please uh, make most of uh, that use. Uh, obviously, you get to see our London hub, you get to use the spaces that we have in terms of our partner hubs, uh, and you have obviously a huge network of partners and um, you know innovators that you can tap into in our community. So uh, hopefully, uh, obviously, it'll all be explained on the link in the website that I shared. So hopefully, that's useful. And um, I think that's everything. Uh, thank you so much, Joanna and Adam, for running the session for us. Um, it's been really, really insightful, really, really good to, to have that overview. And um, I'm sure we'll get in touch again to see what the sort of future sessions we can run. And of course, we've got the event coming up in September in London as well, so as well as online, sorry. Uh, so uh, I will make sure to include the link in the, the registration link in the email as well, so that we've got that right there for you as well. Um, but yeah, any final thoughts, Joanna, Adam? Any sort of last, uh, you know, thoughts to send our attendees away with? Yeah, I, I think uh, it, it would be fun. great. <laughs> it would be great well, to you meet go, you. you. Go first. You go first. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just gonna say it will be great to meet Ladies you. Ladies first, in, yes, Joanna. <laughs> I, I hope to meet yeah. you in Geovation yeah. in September. That's the only thing I will say. Yeah, that's, yes, that's what I would say too. Both Joanna and I are going to be at Geovation when the next code sprints on. So, yeah, it'd be really great to meet people in person. And and I've met, been lucky enough to meet a number of Geovation startups, but it'd be good to meet more and see what they're up to. So, yeah, that's that's probably the best thing to say. Fantastic. Yes, I can only I can only agree to the same. Of course, I'd love to see everyone back in the hub. We feel sometimes we do feel a little lonely because I know it's somewhere and it's a bit quieter, but it'd be lovely to see everyone back and, um, you know, maybe share a drink or two afterwards as well. So, um, yeah, that sounds lovely. Thank you so much again, Joanna and Adam, for your time, for your expertise, for your insights uh, and for running the session for us today. And uh, thanks to everyone who's been attending, um, you know, joining us this, af well, this afternoon. So it is afternoon now, just about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to running these sessions at two o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> so we haven't done many 11 o'clock ones. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us this morning. It's been really nice to see you, even though it's only been virtually um, and via names, but um, it's still nice to know that you've been there and that you've been listening and you've hopefully found the session useful. So thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the week. I shall see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.